dear co-travelers in a yearning for learning. Last time I began by raising two points. The first was that I am not asking for your introduction. The second was a different interpretation of Sehna Vavtu mantra that I intend to use. Today I will explain both these ideas. I did not ask for your introduction because I want to work with you to create it. An introduction that your work will give about you. That which will last you a lifetime. I did get to know your name, but Shakespeare famously said, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. The fragrance therefore is more important than the name. Your work, your PhD thesis will add that fragrance to your life. Your work should be your introduction. It should bring you a good name. You may go around telling a thousand people your name. Will they remember it? That is a good question to ask. If you ask that question, you will be able to understand and you will have a different approach towards the topic. If people remember your work, even if you do not tell them your name, they will search for it and they will try to remember you. Let us try to create such work together. You will create it. I can only catalyze it. When you build a good name, good name comes to me too. This is the Sehna Vavatu approach. So let us take this approach further. Now let us understand this Sehna Vavatu mantra better. I feel more important than memorizing it is to live with its spirit. It asks us to move together, perform together and fill the process of working together with brilliance. This process of learning together should be without misunderstanding. That is, the spirit of cooperation with a oneness of objective. My objective is to get the best out of you. I make no claim to any knowledge. I only seek its spirit. Do not take anything that I say as a statement. It is only an attempt to make you think. When the objective is one or the same, not just in letter but in spirit, can dispute or unnecessary misunderstanding occur? Sehna Vavtu implies that when you get a good name, so do I. If I do not share this spirit, how can oneness emerge? We have something to learn from each other. I have to learn from your questions. Of course, I feel you may learn from my experience. So two things are important here. The process and the spirit. This set of exchanges, we will look at the process. The importance of spirit we will look at in another set of exchanges if and when we get the time and opportunity to do so. There is a popular misconception that these mantras are just verses. If we learn them by heart, we have done enough. There is no further to go. Yes, if we decide not to go further, it will be so. I often try not to learn the mantras but seek to practice their essence. Even though I lose something but I find this easier. So what brings a mantra to life? Its application. What will bring your research to life? 
its application. Why not give a mantra a chance to show how its application can take place in our modern academic curriculum? We will attempt to explore a small dimension of the mantra over the next couple of sessions. The mantra signifies such a oneness that my problem becomes yours and your problem becomes mine. Can we do such an exchange and share with each other the process of dealing with issues? Learning and teaching simultaneously, expanding our vision, exploring our potential together. To proceed in this manner, we must have a oneness of purpose. Can we discover this oneness as signified by the two courses, that is research ethics and research methodology? Can we view these courses through this Sehna Vavtu approach? So let us start. What is the purpose that the course in research methodology and research ethics serves. Are they just tools to solve a problem that you have identified? You have identified that this will be my research topic. So are you thinking that the uh, now one of these methodologies I will use and then I will use my research ethics. That is one way of viewing it. Or can they become a way of identifying the research problem itself? Therefore, the question is, are they informative tools or are they transformational concepts? Is our narrow vision about the courses not allowing us to exploit the full potential hidden in the course? Can understanding these subjects help you transform your ideas, that is, transform the base in the human mind where your thesis idea and its exploration emerges. Can we go to that base using these ideas of these two uh, research methodology and research ethics? So what do we mean by this question? Let us take the example of the topic of your PhD thesis further. Either you have decided it, then can these courses help to, you to explore it better or you are in the process of doing it, process of deciding the topic. Then you want help to decide something where you can excel. Now, is deciding the topic not a process? You want to choose a topic where you can contribute. Even if your topic is clear, you want to add new and new dimensions to it. What processes enable you to add these dimensions? Two things are involved here. One is your assessment of your own capability. And can you expand that capability using these two courses? The second is a gap in the existing knowledge that you identify. Discovering both of these are a process. Can we make this process better? So what is the first thing that comes to your mind about the topic of your PhD? Anyone who asks you this question, you would like to start by answering a few questions. What is your topic contributing? How can it add value? Where will it be applicable? Etc. Etc. After these answers, all that is needed is the methodology and doing research requires following ethics. Is that all the relevance of these courses? Can there be something more to learn from them? A questioning mind may also ask another question. Why? take the course. Why take a course when, when, when the internet is there to tell you all this, you've got it all in front of you. The types of methodologies, 
what comes under qualitative research, what comes under quantitative research. So you go on your own and you decide it. So what are we doing together? This becomes a good question. So what I look on this, this graph that you are seeing, this, this illustration that you are seeing, I look upon it as a wonderful display of food which is displayed in, let us say, a shop. It's a wonderful, very attractive display of food outside. But the teacher helps you choose, eat and then digest the food. Just as a mother has a connection with the child, the teacher too has a subtle connection with the student's work. They help you, suppose you take it as food, they help you choose the right nutrient needed for your body of food that you want to produce. They know the combinations for healthy work. Yes, big data is doing much work today. Quantitative methods have a huge potential. How to use the potential? Some may feel that they can now decide their own menu and cook. It is possible. Is your PhD thesis just going to be like a selfie with an with attractive looking food? Or is it going to be digested, absorbed within you, giving it lifelong strength and energy to serve yourself and serve society simultaneously? So the question is, is your work going to become a part of your life and lifestyle? Only then can we say that learning has become lifelong learning. So what is the role of the teacher? The Sena Vavtu Mantra is an interaction in the process of learning. Is it still relevant? I can say if I know my research topic, do I need these courses? It's a good question. With big data emerging, why not research only that? Outside internet learning or big data application, is there any big opportunity in the world now? The qualitative aspect of teaching, research and living life are interrelated with our quantitative world. A big data consultant has said that with the advent of big data, the quantitative analytics is receiving definitely more attention and buzz, but their impression is that the majority of the quantitative analytics is descriptive or predictive and does not attempt to explain to decision makers what it is describing or what it is predicting. So this is what we can call the qualitative side of quantitative research. So everything is interdependent and we have to learn this interdependence through interaction, through experience, through exchange of ideas. Therefore there is a relevance of human skills. You need them. Hence we need to, to learn them together. That is Sahina Bhavati. Who will explain how to understand, interpret and explain data? Who will teach it? Who will look at data so as to feel the hidden emotions of people behind the data? So the teacher is the first researcher. We must understand this concept. All research helps to understand the target to be achieved in depth. What is the teacher's target? The student's mind. How can the concepts that the teacher needs to teach be absorbed in the mind so as to transform the mind? That's what he wants. This requires not only just skills in communicating, but understanding the mind which has to be transformed qualitative research that deals with real life situations involving people is doing the same. The objective of 
qualitative research involving people is the same as the objective of the research in the mind of the teacher that is going on involving the students and what is the real life situation the classroom or our interaction like this is the real life situation which is involving the students so can we learn from the way the teacher learns because I feel that the teacher applies the spirit of the research method methodology ideas to teach us. This is a hypothesis that I have and you can test this hypothesis. We, uh, you know, we, we can have a, this is a different way of looking at the situation that, you know, the teacher uses his or her experience subtly exploring the mind of the student to know how to teach what. He or she does not use big data of thousands of students in hundreds of universities to figure out, figure that out. How do you learn this skill? Is the teacher subtly in, his, in the teacher's mind living with the spirit of research methods? Look at ethnography research. What is it about? It is about immersing yourself in the target participant's environment. That is the student's environment. To understand what? The goals, the culture, the challenges, the motivations and themes that emerge. Do teachers not subtly immerse themselves in the culture of students for years? Because ethnography also involves years of such immersion. Or would you say that their approach is phenomenological, which dis actually describes the essence of an activity? It uses a combination of all methods to find out the meaning of things to the target audience. So the teacher cannot think that I have understood the concept in my way. Now he has to be in the student's mind to know can the student understand it in the way that I have understood or will he need to or she need to understand it differently. So you have to enter the student's mind or visualize the student's mind. Even the Urdu poet Ghalib says, Agar apna kaha aap hi samjhe to kya samjhe? Maza kehne ka tab hai jab ek kahe aur dusra samjhe. So how to make the other person understand is a skill of the mind. It's the spirit of research. Let's take a simple case of interaction over the web. Yes, quantitative data can help us. How? How much time does the student spend on the content? What is the amount of content the student accesses? The achievement of the student can also be measured. But how to measure the student's experience and how it impacts the comprehension of the material? Teachers actually worry about these concepts. How can we learn to apply the essence of research methods as a thought process? We can ask or raise a hypothesis. Is this how teachers learn about students? Now, if we have to test it, can students learn how to live in the subtle spirit of research methods as a lifelong art of investigating phenomena? Can we make it a lifelong art of investigating the way the teacher is doing? Will this skill make them lifelong researchers doing lifelong learning? So that whatever the problem they encounter at work or in life, can they apply these theories, these research methodologies? Is the PhD thesis then not just a preparation for future work, but is it also 
a preparation for future life? That becomes the question. Similarly, let's go to research ethics. Research ethics covers these topics and you will be going through them. You have seen them in your course material. But can they help you select or explore a topic? That becomes the question. So what does research ethics theory teach us? It teaches us very simple things and they are very, very important. That researchers should not collect data from minors without guardian permission. Everyone should know when they are participating that they are giving their consent in an informed way. And if it is serious matter, it should be in writing. Because we have to protect from physical and psychological harm. And that includes protecting their dignity, their autonomy, their self-esteem. Maintaining confidentiality, protect against deception and everything should be voluntary. So these are the ethics of research. They are very important. But is there more to it? What else can research ethics teach? Can it be integrated into researching everything? Can it cover research into ethics to help spread their use? We want ethics to spread in society. So what is ethics? To us, to individuals, can we take that research method within ourselves? Can we absorb it? Just as we absorb how to uh, learn about students so that we can teach them, can we learn similarly about ethics so as we can learn it and we can so that it can be spread? Is it how to use ethics as a basic of research for everything? Preparing the human mind to use it as a first choice in all thought and this should come naturally. So, Ethics is a natural first choice of human expression. How to prove that it shows our identity, our distinction from others? Can we address these questions? Can a syllabus and a teacher do something? So let us see what can a syllabus and a teacher do. A syllabus and a teacher and a course should help you recognize that you have a unique potential. This unique potential until you recognize the course has not really succeeded. Because you must get that, that experience of your potential and everybody has a unique potential. So how can the course do it? It should throw up ideas, it should throw up contexts and case studies that help you discover your own potential. Once this potential emerges slowly, then the nature of problem that such a potential can solve starts becoming clear itself. So you know, I have the capability of doing this. So we have to develop that capability to improve your area, expand your area of research then the research purpose can be decided by you once you have got confidence that what is your potential. So the purpose of clarifying your potential, can it be solved and merged with the purpose of using these courses? So can the spirit of research methodologies be used to demonstrate the oneness of what you seek and what we want to deliver? Can you learn from the exploratory process? Because it's an exploration. Self-discovery is an exploration. And the course is also an exploration. By And can this exploration be done through the course content itself? So what is the logic for exploring such an approach that we are taking? Is there a logic for it? 
so let's go to what is it that you your you want your research to achieve so you want your research to achieve something can you experience that change within you yourself what you want can you get that experience that once things are changed can you experience it within yourself what that change will be like what will it feel like as they say be the change that you want to see in the world let us apply this logic to the course design and methodology of research ethics and research methodology courses first let's begin like that because until we do it to our course how can you do it to your research that's a question the course instructors are asking themselves so can we help each other identify what is the potential of the course so that the course can help you decide what is your potential and then you apply that potential to your phd research so can we view the course design of these courses as a case study to see how to uncover the potential within these courses there is a potential hidden you within you so is there such a potential hidden within the course can we take that out and can we take that out in front of you like an operation so that you can also do it within yourself and take out that potential within yourself because everything is a process can we learn the process so how do we expand potential there is an old saying tell me and i will forget so when the teacher comes to the class speaks something he takes down writes down all the notes you write down you copy the notes you forgot me tell me and i will forget show me and i may remember you are doing the surgery you are showing it may remember involve me and i will learn that is the key involve me and i learn the case method is just showing that learning was done earlier in one case how learning was done earlier in one case but the sahna vaktu mantras concept involves it implies cooperation therefore this topic today is what we call a new approach to teaching learning together the sahna vaktu approach this is a new approach to curriculum design it is a new approach to learning it is a new approach to teaching it is a new approach to living life it is a new approach to doing work it is a new approach of doing research and then we come down to that it is a new research new way of learning research methodology and research ethics that comes in the end it starts with you and ends with the course the sahna vaktu mantra implies cooperation using a case method can we try to create the spirit of the sahna vaktu mantra because the case method is a little better than just teaching and telling so can we use the case method to ignite to fire the spirit of the sahna vaktu mantra then let's go to the definition can we relish the content by moving in the course design together can we expand the course and our potential together to perform with brilliance will such an expansion of potential help discover and explore your research topic in a better way and simultaneously will it create a better course design for future so can we use a research methodology to teach the research methodology and research ethics course this is an interesting way of looking at it that we are using a research methodology to teach a research methodology and a research ethics course so let's let's try it 
your PhD is about experimentation. You have to throw up ideas. You have to build hypotheses. You have to test them. You have to validate them. So let's try it together. Harvard is known to have used the case method effectively. So what is a case do? A case describes a situation and helps us explore its various dimensions. So this method can be useful because it is helping us to explore. Now let us take the case of a surgeon who has done an operation in a new way. A case is written by a third party about him and taught to students some sitting somewhere else. This will always be give useful inputs to students. It's a very accepted and a very good way of learning. Will some students find it more useful if the surgeon is himself present in the class? Will it not be even better if the surgeon performs in front of you? Maybe the best thing will be if the surgeon shows how he is doing and makes you do the same simultaneously. We will try this last approach now. We take a real life example to see how to apply skills. Please, from now on, whatever I am saying, draw a parallel with your research topic during this case. We are going to define a research problem to help you explore your topic. The problem is different. Your topic is different. We are going to go through a problem in such a way and perform surgery on it in such a way that you can do a similar surgery or see the processes and use those processes to, the sur to do the surgery within and explore your topic. It is being done to help you ask new questions when doing research. Please see how will you explore all possibilities of adding value. In the process, you will be able to expand your ability to analyze. With increased ability, how will you explore solutions to your research? How will you use the essence of research methodology and research ethics in a live situation? Because now it's a live situation. We are giving a case, we are throwing it open. Now it's a live situation, a live interaction between you and us. Please keep thinking only of that from now on. Your research, not the case. So let us describe the case situation. Now I think I need to share this with you. For the first time, let us say a course in say research ethics has been started. The material on it globally is there, but the instructor feels it is scanty and not to the satisfaction, not to the satis full satisfaction. The instructor has a different perception of use of ethics and its effectiveness than what the current material is suggesting. The instructor feels that ethics has a huge potential that is not being explored fully. He is convinced of its use in academics and in life. So what should he do? This is the question. Should he follow what the world is doing? Or can he use the course to discover his and students' potential together? This becomes, I leave you with this question. And with this question in mind, draw a parallel. Let us uh, think of your research topic. Now, I have described my problem. Now, think of your research topic similar, similarly. The research topic should help expand your potential both professional and personal. It should identify an existing gap in the current approach in your area of interest. The area of interest of the course instructor is to design a course and how to teach it. He is trying to find a gap in the current approach. So how are you trying to find a gap in the current approach in your area of research? Qualitative research always starts with a well-formed hypothesis. You can see that a gap has been identified in current way of imparting knowledge. 
is this a real gap or is it not? We have to research that. Only then our hypothesis will be well formed. We will be doing it in the next session or sessions. But before we do so, can you identify such a gap yourself? Can you think of how to build a well formed hypothesis about it? And before doing that, can the hypothesis you, you frame expand your search? Think of it that way. So, can your research see a problem differently? To see a problem differently, my suggestion, and you can differ, is to start with the application of the research. What is needed? So, we know that in the world, the only thing that is constant in the world is change. So, you are sure that one thing will always happen, that is change. How to offer a lasting situation, a solution in such a situation? How to, how to offer it? If that is not possible, can the solution that you seek be a little more long lasting than others? This can be one way of structuring your thoughts. I'm not saying that you follow it, but it's a suggestion. Can you structure your thoughts like that? Such an approach starts with a need that is there, but is yet to be fulfilled in us way that is satisfactory to you. You feel it is not being done in a satisfactory way. Other people who are delivering the same course are feeling it is in a satisfactory way. That's fine. But you have a feeling and you have a right to express your feeling. So can your research go to larger and larger needs? Instead of looking how to explore the current topics better, can it look at not only that but also look at expanding the number of topics that the course is covering? If so, then to apply this idea, this course must seek to address the largest need it can satisfy. So how do I, we go to the largest need that can be satisfied by this course? If we can identify that largest need, that should help you identify the larger need, that larger purpose, the larger problem that your research can identify. So how to search for the largest issue? Let us take an example. What is the big issue that will face our students always in life? A teacher will think like this. So is it global change? Let's look at the changes that have happened in say, just 20 years. The world suffered a dot-com burst at the turn of the century. Then it witnessed a global economic recession in 2008. 2020 has witnessed a pandemic and we are instead of being face to face, we are video to video. What the world learned from them and what can you learn from them? What is the nature? What is the nature of the changes that have taken place? Can we teach our students to prepare for them? A teacher is thinking like this. So, can the biggest challenge of the world be linked to our course design or our course content to help students? This is what troubles a teacher. To teach application of knowledge, we should first demonstrate it. How to do it? How to transform the course curriculum in a way that demonstrates this? For this, it must show a way out of the problem. This will give students a live example of how to apply. So let us identify such a problem and design a course content to show application of the concepts of the courses, both the courses. Please have a look at this carefully. This is what has changed in the world and why did it change? The OECD is uh, consist started with the 20 wealthiest democracies of the world. Then it is now expanded to about 35 odd members, include, including some European Union members. So they, after 2008 recession, looked at what has gone wrong. And they started right from 
the right from 2008 or right from the beginning of the industrial revolution so they said that the race between technology that uh, you know technology was led by a lot of education the growth of education and technology happened together so you can all already see that they are bringing together different types of uh, contexts and joining them in a research so there's a research methodology hidden in this graph that you must notice that there is technology growing at a certain pace and they are seeing the growth of education and they are seeing that universal public schooling and uh, you know in the uh, digital revolution and industrial revolution there has been a, accompanied by a lot of growth of education but they are seeing that all this economic progress despite using modern education has led to an experience of social pain Is this what we wanted? Is this the objective of education? Is this the purpose of what we, you and I are sitting together to discuss? So this way, now that we have widened our perspective enough to approach the biggest problem, this is the biggest problem of the world, that they want education now to go in such a manner that social pain is minimized or it is removed there is social prosperity along with without social pain so that is the biggest problem and it has to deal with education and we are participating in that process so how to widen our perspective to see the biggest challenge be bold enough approach the biggest problem and then proceed with your search by now, we have reached the stage of problem identification. We have yet to see how others see a solution to a problem. We will try to find our solution. But before that, we have to see how others see a solution to this problem. Have we identified a gap in the methodology? If so, we have yet to form a well-formed hypothesis. How have you proceeded? Have you taken similar steps? Think over how you can guide yourself to proceed. Let us travel the journey together. Let the end of this session be the beginning of a new journey for you. This is what I call the Sehna Vavatu approach. Welcome to the Sehna Vavatu approach and we I will now wait for your questions. Thank you.